what's in the bag, what's inside the bag out in the field sponsored by Outtex. So just want to remember and uh, give a huge thanks to Outtex for sponsoring the event. Michael, for being here, if you have any questions, make sure to drop them below. You can use the Q&A tab here on Zoom. If you're joining us on Facebook or Vimeo, you can use the chat functionality and we'll get those questions to Michael. But otherwise, that's all you're going to see of me. I'm going to disappear into the ether and I'll come back later, Michael. It's uh, all yours. Thanks for being here. Great. Thanks, Scott. All right, folks. Well, welcome back to Telling Stories That Matter. Again, my name is Mike Snyder. I'm a photographer. I'm a filmmaker. I'm based in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, principally, I work on social justice and environmental stories, and I work on location here in the U.S., but I also work all around the world um, and often in very remote and rugged locations. Uh, and again, this is part two of a two-part series. I do uh, hope you go back and get a chance to look at part one if you haven't seen it already. We talked about storytelling and the power of story, and we said we need to have great stories and then tell them with great pieces and critical pieces of gear. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So today we're going inside of my bag and we're going to unpack it. I'm going to show you some of the gear that I use in the field, some of my top choices, and also reveal a few shooting tips for you. Uh, just before I begin, I want to say thanks as well to, um, to Altex, our sponsor. Um, the guys at Altex have been really, really great to work with. They've got some truly excellent gear that, that can be game-changing um, for how you shoot. And I'm going to be showing some of that to you today. OK, so before we start pulling out uh, some of my gear out of the bag that I've got sitting over here, I want to give you an important qualifier. And that's the, the kind of photographic work that you, that you do will dictate the kind of gear that you have, okay? So there's no such thing as the best gear. There's really just the best gear for the job. So if you're a fine art photographer, your bag is gonna look different than if you're a wedding photographer or me, I'm principally um, a documentary and a, a photojournalist shooter. Each one of those bags is gonna look a little bit different, right? So I, I'm really interested in people and what they do. I work in remote locations and my gear reflects that. And, and the second thing to note here is it took me over a decade, well over a decade, um, to build up the gear that I that I have here. Um, photo stuff is crazy expensive, so you don't have to get all of this at once to be good at what you do. You can start slowly and you can build up, okay? And at the end of when I go through all the gear, I'm gonna be talking to you directly. I'll share with you um, in screen share a list of the gear that I work with, and you can check that out. You can screen capture it, and most of that gear is available at the NH if you wanna pick it up down the road, okay? Great, so let's get rolling. We're gonna start right away with the bag itself. Uh, and this might be a, a surprising piece of gear, but is also a critical piece of gear. So I'm going to show you what I got here. Uh, this is my bag. I've been using it for almost a decade now, maybe about eight years. Um, it's an F-stop uh, Satori bag, and I believe they're called Tolopa bags these days. These days. But the, the reason I, I, I picked this guy out is that before becoming a photographer, I spent a lot of time in the field um, as a backcountry hiker, as a skier, as a climber, and I really wanted a bag that functioned first and foremost as an adventure bag. And this thing is, is built to last. As I said, I've had this in the field for eight or nine years. Um, and if you look at it, it's almost as good as the day that I, the day that I got it. So it's built out of super quality materials. Um, it does relatively well in the rain. You still need a rain cover. We're gonna come to the rain cover later. Um, but critically, when you look for a bag, it doesn't have to be this one. The main thing that I would suggest looking for, if you're gonna be working out in the field, is can it carry the weight properly? Because if you're like me and I want to get all of this gear into my bag, I want it to fit well on my back. And so you want to be able to go and pick the bag up at the store if you can, try it on and see how it feels. Okay, so the build quality is one thing. Its ability to carry weight is another. Um, the size, of course, is really important. This is a 60 liter. You may need an 80 liter depending on the size of your bag. Right. And for me, I really like that the zipper is right here because then when I'm in the field in a place that's maybe a little sketchier, I'm worried somebody might get into the bag. I know that it's the only way to get in is from is from the backside. Okay, so again, this is a uh, it's an F stop Sapori, and I believe they're called Tolopa bags these days. But but really bomb proof, and I can fit practically everything that I need in a given day when I'm out in the field in this bag. All right, second up is another piece of baggery, right? And this is the classic Pelican case, and this is a Pelican one five one zero case. Um, and it's important to know that because this size case is just the right size that it'll fit in an overhead locker when you travel. And that's really, really important. A lot of times whenever I fly, um, I'll put my backpack on and that backpack is big enough it can fit in an overhead as well. I'll put the backpack on, that's my uh, hand item as it were. And this is my carry-on item. And I can actually go with both of these and not check anything. So that's a really, really nice feature. Um, these things are just classic. They're basically bomb proof. You can lock them up 
Um, and I'll bring this with me if I need it. If I can fit everything in one bag, I'll do that. If I can't, I'll bring this with me too. And this can sit in headquarters. Uh, whenever I'm out in the field, this can go with me in the car. Um, I can maybe keep filmmaking gear if I need it in, inside of this. Um, so these are really, really great. And again, the size that I've got is the 1510. Okay, so Pelican bag, great, or case I should say, really great backup piece of equipment for travel. Okay, next up, camera bodies. Um, so I am currently shooting with an R5. Uh, and it's a, this is a Canon R5. Before this, I had the 5D Mark IV, the 5D Mark III. And I've also shot with Sony's and with Nikon's. And, and the first thing I wanna say about camera bodies is look, all of the major companies making cameras today make, make really, really great camera bodies. Um, you know, I think picking one or the other is really up to you. There's certain reasons why you, why you might wanna go with one over the under, over the other. Again, I've shot with all of them. I like them all. I, I went with Canon for, for two reasons. The, the first is that the lens set they have is just spectacular. Right? And that's the main reason why I've done it. The second is that they were one of the first to jump out and do video really, really well. And that was important for me because I do photo and video together. So they were really great for that. And then of course, once you buy into an ecosystem and I've been in, I've been a Canon shooter for 10 years, you're in it, it makes sense to keep going. But if you're a Nikon shooter or you're a Sony shooter or Fuji or whatever you work with, that's totally fine. There's no reason I think to be able to change, to, to need to change out your gear. You can keep working from where you are. Okay, so I've got my uh, my R5. Ideally, you travel with two bodies. Um, that's just in case one goes down or one gets wet, or maybe you've got two lenses you want to switch out really, really quickly. Ideally, you travel with two. Um, okay, lenses. Oh, no, I'll say one more thing about cameras, actually, uh, and that is your phone. Um, this is a really, really great behind the scenes uh, camera, and I actually use it quite a bit. If you want to make little videos about why you do what you do, um, you want know, to make little photos. This is super, super, super handy. Um, and I've gotten better over the years. I was really bad at it at first um, on productions and on shoots to remember to do the behind the scenes stuff. But telling the story about the story can be really important. So this is this is a critical tool. And these are amazingly handy things. And so you can use them for a lot of things as well. So this is another camera in your bag. Okay, let's talk about lenses. And you know that is the more important choice for me between the bodies um, and the lenses. The lens is the more important thing. So I'll tell you what I work with. The first one, you already saw it right here on the camera. This is the Canon 24 to 70 lens. And to, to me, this is the lens for photojournalism, for documentary work. Um, and it's principally because this range is the range that works best for the kind of shots you wanna get. It's wide enough that you can get a wide angle shot and it's tight enough that you can get a portrait and then everything in between. It's a, it's a mid range zoom. Um, so for, for me and the kind of work that I wanna do, that's, that's by far the best. The, the, the second thing about this lens, um, is it opens all the way up to 2.8. So you can shoot this in, in relatively low light and it still works really, really well. Um, and then it's the new lens, the R, uh, the R series lens has got a stabilizer on it. So, you know, you can get sharper pictures for sure if you go with a prime, um, but you only give up a tiny bit to work with a lens like this and you still get uh, amazing images out of it. So I shoot this probably 90% of the time on, uh, on, on my camera and I love the way that it looks. So it's my top choice. Next up, I also carry with me a telephoto lens. And this is Canon's 70 to 200 telephoto lens. So this is really, really critical when you need to get a, a, you know, a portrait or you want to get a longer shot. There's just some things you are not going to be able to get with your 24 to 70. It's going to be disappointing. So I like to pick up a telephoto lens. Um, I've shot with other ones. I've shot from with the 100 to 400. Um, I've never liked that quite as much. It never was quite as tack sharp as this one is. Um, this one's got a great stabilizer in it. And if you ever do need to go longer, you can always get an extender. So I've got a 2X extender. This is relatively small. Okay, so these are the two main lenses that I shoot with. And I used to have a 16 to 35 as well when I wanted to go really wide. Um, and that was a 16 to 35 um, F4 and it was stabilized. But again, now that this has got that stabilizer on there, I can keep this lens on my body almost all the time. And I absolutely love the way it looks. Okay, so those two lens, a mid-range zoom, a telephoto zoom, and then finally, I take one prime lens with me. Um, this is the, the Canon 35 millimeter 1.4, um, but I also have an 85 1.4 and then the 50 1.2. And, and what I will say here, and this is your lens you're gonna use uh, for low light. If you wanna get that narrow depth of field look, if you wanna shoot portraits with it, I think it's great to have one of these. Between which focal length to choose, it's really up to you. It's a stylistic choice. So play with all of them if you can, rent them, 
check them out and pick which one you like most. I, I change them up depending on the kind of work that I'm doing, depending on the shoot that I'm in. I do usually only take one so I can fit it all into my camera bag, um, but pick which one that you like best for you. And of course, this is an EF lens, the older lens. So I have to have the EF to RF converter on top to make it all work. Okay, so one mid-range zoom, one telephoto zoom, uh, one prime lens, and one converter. Okay, that's the lenses we've got. Uh, now this next section, and, and we'll come around to the questions here at the end, if anything's kind of coming up, um, I'm sort of blowing through some of the details here, but we'll come back to it. Okay, the next section, I'm gonna talk to you about some extras in your bag. And these extras can make a really huge deal uh, to sort of set you apart from the competition, really make your photos stand out and shine. They're not as critical as your lens set, as your camera choice, but they're gonna make a really, really big difference once you've got those things in place and you really wanna stand out. So we're gonna talk about lighting, we're gonna talk about aerial options, we're gonna talk about underwater, underwater housing, and about tripods as well. And let's start first with a tripod option. Now, again, I'm, I'm a documentary shooter principally, so you would think, why do you, why do you need a tripod? What do you use a tripod for? Well, there's still lots of things you do, even if you principally shoot with your camera in your hand. Um, you may have certain kinds of shots, like an off-camera flash you wanna use or a nighttime photo you wanna do. Um, I shoot uh, video as well, so having a tripod is really important for video. Sometimes I'll put lighting on a tripod. Um, so there's all kinds of things this is still really handy for. And I would recommend most people, if you can, invest in a quality tripod because the chances are this is gonna outlast the rest of your gear. Um, I've had this one for almost 10 years. I anticipate it'll last a lot, a lot longer than that. So this is the three-legged thing, Winston. As you can see, it's, it's quite a bit bigger than most of the travel tripods you get, but I wanted something that was really strong, really robust, could hold up an expensive piece of lighting and not go down if I, if I weighed it properly. Um, so it doesn't have sections on its leg. It's got um, one solid section here. Um, and I wanted something that was also good for video. It'd be really, really stable for video. So I compromised a little bit on size, but this one is the exact same size as the bag that I have. So it'll still go on the side of the bag and it can still go in the overhead compartment. Okay, so uh, three-legged thing, Winston. And I'm also down here at the bottom, a little important extra to note, um, three-legged thing makes a, a clip called a tools and it's got a hex key that fits all of the, the, the hexes that are on your tripod. It's got a little, um, like a screwdriver tip. It's got a beer opener. And also you can hang a weight from this if you want to weight your tripod down. So nice little extra here, super cheap, it's like eight bucks. And I just put it on the bottom there. Okay, so tripod, a tripod option. Let's talk a little bit about lighting. So even though I principally shoot with available lighting, I do like to bring some lighting with me. It can be really nice for, for portraits um, and also uh, handy if you want to do video as well. So I'm going to show you three options here. The first one is a uh, FNV, FNV, excuse me, HDR 300. And this is just a nice little ring light. It's got an option on the back to put a battery into it. Uh, it's got a wheel so you can dim it up and dim it down. And it also takes DC power if you want to plug it into the wall. So there's lots of ways that you can use this. It's super lightweight, super small. You can be able to hold it up and hold it into location to get where you want it. You can place it over in a corner if you want to place it somewhere. And it's also got a tripod mount. So there's a, there's a lot that you can do with this. Here in a moment, when I'm done speaking, I'm going to show you some slides and show you some photos um, that I made with these pieces of gear. Uh, but this thing is really super handy. The important to know about a, a constant light, this is not a flash, um, is that even when you dial it all, all the way, you're never going to overpower the sun with this, right? So this is really only good in low light settings. Um, you can try to use it outdoors when there's light. Um, but it's only going to work if it's low light and it's overcast. And even then, you've got to get it in really close to your subject. So this is a great tool. It is a little bit limited in terms of what it can do. Um, I'll show you in a minute an even more powerful tool, but it's also very affordable. This is maybe only, only $300, which is cheap as far as photo gear goes. So FNV 300. Another nice little tool. And if you need to pack down to something very small, um, these things are really, really great for that. This is a Loom Cube. I don't know if you've seen a Loom Cube before or not, um, but these are very, very small LED lights. They've got a number of different settings on them in terms of brightness. Again, they can mount to a tripod. You can stick these almost anywhere with the accessories you can get on them, and you can even stick them on a drum. So they are really, really cool, really, really small, relatively affordable lights that you can bring along with you that you can use for all kinds of creative things. Okay, Loom Cube. And then finally, the big boy, and I've got him right here behind me, is a Prophoto B10. Uh, and I'm going to go get that and bring it over. All right, 
Well, check out this guy. Okay, this is a profile to be 10 and it looks huge. You would think, how could you possibly be working in the field, um, in remote locations, traveling with this thing? But let me break this down for you just a little bit. And take the hood off. So when you take that off and you take the mount off, you realize this thing is only about the size of a lens. In fact, if you hold up the 70 to 200, it's even smaller than that. So this is actually incredibly packable, about the size that a lens might fit into your bag. Uh, and this is a really powerful strobe light. So what this does, it's a constant light. You can use it like a constant light. You can dial it way up, just like the f &B. but it's also a flash. So it's an off-camera flash for your, for your camera. Um, and it allows you to create some really, really amazing portraits with really great dynamic lighting. The light quality in here is absolutely incredible. It's super intuitive and easy to use. And it's also really, really lightweight. Profoto B10 is what this is called. Now, these are really expensive. Um, this was an investment for me. You know, this costs almost as much as a lens. Um, but if you really want to get into high end, really beautiful, really gorgeous um, lighting looks that are more crafted and created for your portraits, this is a great way to be able to set yourself apart. And we can say more about this in the questions. So there's this, um, this comes off here. You can pack this thing down, it's got batteries. And again, the hood, and there's several different light modifiers that you can get, this packs down flat too. It comes down to about the size of a laptop and I put it in the back of my bag. Right? So it actually looks big, but it packs down really small. Okay, so that's our lighting options that I bring. We've got the FMV, we've got the Loom Cube, and we've got the Profoto B10. Okay, and then let's talk a little bit about aerial options. I have a Mavic 2 drone here, Mavic 2 Pro, I believe it is actually. And I, I don't know if you've seen one of these things or not, but I've been flying drones for almost 10 years now. And the evolution from the early drones to this is just amazing. Again, this thing is about the size of a large lens, roughly. So it fits in your backpack. Um, it's, it's incredibly light. Um, these things are getting easier and easier to use. You do have to train if you want to do it uh, professionally. You've got to get a license to, to, to fly these things these days. But they are getting easier and easier to use. And you use your phone as a screen to do it. So you already have half the gear if you've got a phone. And the critical things about drones is they let you see the issues that you're working on. If you're working on social issues or environmental issues, particularly environmental issues, they let you be able to see um, the, the, the place that you're working in. Uh, in, in a way that you just cannot without a drone. And I have a number of projects that I work on that give you the vantage point that you need to really be able to tell that story. So these are just a really in incredibly powerful tool. Um, nowadays, drones go for about the cost of a lens or even not that expensive of a lens. Um, there is the new Mavic 3 that just came out that looks, looks really, really good as well. Okay, so lots more we can say about drones, but of course I do bring a drone with me. Right, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the Outex. And this is, this is basically the main component of the optics. And I don't know if anyone here has shot uh, underwater photography before, but I started out doing it a number of years ago. And you used to have these huge, hard housings that you would work with. And they were made out of hard plastic, and they were expensive, and they were huge, and they were heavy, and you couldn't get your fingers inside to be able to adjust the camera. So they were a real pain to use. And for me, again, who wants to travel light, I want to travel fast, I want to be able to work in the field easily, that was just not going to work. I tried it once or twice, and I just gave up on it. And then I found out about this product. So this is it. Uh, and if you look here, this thing is incredibly light. It's incredibly small. I'll unpack it for you and show you what it is. It is a rubberized housing you put your camera inside. You can see it's in the shape of the camera. So your camera fits inside of there and then you seal it on either ends with a glass on the back that you can see through to see into your camera and with optical glass on the front that allows you to keep taking great images. And if you seal it properly and it's not very hard to do, there's some great how-to guides online, you can take this thing underwater and it stays uh, very, very watertight. I've never had any issues with it whatsoever. Right, so why is this great? Well, it's, it's amazing because being able to go underwater or halfway underwater is an, an incredible look. It really, really sets you apart. But you can also use it in a lot of other spaces as well. I use it um, when there's a lot of sand or when there's a lot of dust or there's you know things being thrown around. I'm working at a farm and stuff is flying everywhere. There's a lot of situations that you can be able to use this in and to be able to keep your camera safe. So I've been saying again, you put um, a, a glass piece on the back and you put a glass piece in the front. Let me show you two options that they have. The first is a smaller dome and you can get different threads depending on your, the size of your, um, your filter thread for your camera. And then it's got a dome that goes on the front. Or if you really wanna splash out and get the really high end piece, they've got a much larger optical dome as well. 
and I'll show that to you really quick, which is here, which is quite a bit bigger. Um, for me, depending on what I'm doing, um, I'm able to fit uh, one or the other in my bag. Um, but if you don't have much space, you can certainly go for the, for the smaller one. Okay, so like I said, this is uh, incredibly uh, lightweight. It's extremely packable. The cost is, is very, very affordable. Um, it offers high-end protection. Um, the glass itself is pro, like the, the, the pictures that come through the glass look just as good as the glass that comes out of the end of your camera. And it's incredibly modular. So, you know, you can use this in a lot of different ways. As I said, you can put, they have a, a kit, you can put a flash on here. They've got a pistol grip option. Um, they've got a tether you can do if you want to be able to run a wire to be able to control this remotely. Um, I've got one that allows you to put it on a tripod and then I can drop this down um, into the water for craning shots for video. So there's just a lot of different ways that you can be able to use this tool. And again, while giving up very little real estate in your pack. So super, super handy tool to have. Okay, that's the main pieces. And now I want to take you over and talk about some of the extras because the extras that you bring along can be just as important as the big pieces. Let me grab my box here. Okay, so what do I bring that are the extras? Right, first one, a travel umbrella, really, really handy. I've got a lightweight hiking umbrella. Um, if it starts to rain, I just pop these things out. I put it over my bag. Or if I want to be shooting out in the rain, this is really, really easy. I can hold it with one hand. It's super, super lightweight. Again, I went for one that's the length of my pack, so it fits right on the side. It's easy to carry a little umbrella. Next up, you can up your strap game. Um, this is a uh, Peak Design slide strap. These things are, are just amazing. They're bomb proof. Um, they come on and off really easily. They hold your camera really well. Well, you've got these little ends that can pop out uh, super quickly if you need to take your camera off. You want to use it for video and put it into a different system. Um, and they look great. Uh, and they're just, they're just spectacular. So I definitely recommend upping your strap game. I've got one for each body. Um, if you're out in the field and you're working in rough places like I do, you're going to want a pack cover. I've got a relatively cheap, again, it's a 60 liter pack cover from REI. Um, I put this on the top of my pack. As soon as it starts to rain, I wrap it around a mountain field on a, on a boat. Um, I put this around my pack. It's not going to protect from everything, but if you're getting splashed on, you're getting rained on, it's going to give you enough protection to keep your gear safe. Okay, I use filters. Um, I'm not a fine art photographer, so I'm not throwing tons of filters in front of my lenses, but I do use a neutral density filter quite frequently uh, for video. It's really important for video. And I use some other filters as well as I need them. And of course, I've got a bunch of different lenses to fit them to. So I've got step down rings to fit my filters to my lenses. So I use a rugged case to be able to hold these. You can find these on BNH. Um, and it's got a little loop in the back if you want to put this on your belt. So for very, very quick access, you can pop out your neutral density filter. You can switch over to shooting uh, video from photo. You can put it back in and it's all accessible and it's right here and it's quite well protected. So a filter case, I get one from Ruggard. Also from Ruggard, I've got a battery case. This one holds two batteries. I have two of these. Um, the new... Um, uh, RF cameras absolutely burn through batteries. If you don't know yet, if you haven't switched over yet, they do chug through much, much more quickly uh, than the old um, EF uh, mirrored cameras that the mirrorless use up a lot more power. So you need these at the ready. And again, these have a battery loop, or sorry, a belt loop, so you can get to them really quickly. So that's a rugged battery case I bring with me. Filter wrench, so you can take on and off your filters super quickly. And this is just a relatively cheap one. You put it on, you pop it off. You don't want to have a filter get stuck on your camera. Lens wipes, I use ones from Spuds. Um, you can clip these onto your bag. I keep one clipped inside of my bag, so it's always there. Uh, I keep one um, clipped somewhere on me or inside of a jacket, so I've got one. Uh, these are really high-end microfiber cloths. Again, if you're working in the field, you get stuff on your lens, it's raining out, it gets dirty, you wanna be able to get it off really, really quickly and also protect your lens. So I put these on there. Oh, and I wanna say on the filters, I forgot to mention this. Um, I do put a filter in front of all of my lenses. Um, I don't actually leave um, the, the the front element of the of the lenses exposed, uh, and I use um, B and W um, XS Pro, I believe they're called. Yeah, XS Pro filters. Card case and extra cards, of course. This is a JJC, relatively cheap one. I've actually tried the Pelican case um, options in the past, and I, I like this one a little bit better. Um, I've had my Pelican case ones fall apart, kind of surprising because I think they make great hard cases, but. I just went for a cheaper one here. 
Uh, a Timex watch, these things are really, really important. I do not rely on my Apple watch when I'm in the field and you gotta charge it every single day. I want something that is just bomb proof, really, really easy um, to, 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 to keep on you and to keep going. Um, so these things are really, really great, 30 bucks or so. You wanna know what time it is to get the right lights. A Leatherman Wave, really, really handy tool to have along with you. Um, you can do a lot with your camera gear, of course, with this, but also there's lots of other things in the field you would need this for. I use this all the time. Petzl head torch. There's all kinds of situations which you need this. If you're up early to shoot, you're probably getting up really early to shoot. Um, if you're working in the field, you're probably staying up late. You want to stay safe and you want to have a headlamp or head torch, as it's called. And along that line, a water bottle as well. I bring a metal water bottle with me. Every single place that I go out in the field, you want to stay safe and bring that with you. Okay, and then finally, remote release. Uh, in case you want to do any filming of yourself, this is really, really handy. Or in case you want to be able to access the camera when it's um, it's it's out of your possession, a remote release is really, really handy. And finally, um, mesh bags to be able to carry um, extra batteries like AA batteries, AAA batteries with you. I put those in the bag. Okay, so that's the extras. And then finally, I want to swap over now and show you some examples of some photos that I've made using some of this gear so you can see what it looks like. Give me one sec while I bring this up. Okay, great. And hopefully you can see that, yes? Yeah, great. Okay, yes. so let's show you some examples. Perfect, great. And again, here I am. If you haven't already seen my work before, you can find me at Michael Snyder or michaelosnyder.com. Okay, there's my uh, gear list. I didn't go through all of the extras there for you. Um, you can go and check this out on, on your own. There's a list of the lenses and the bodies you can check out. And again, you can try and see if you can find those um, at BNH. We'll come back around to this when we have the question period at the end. You can ask me any questions about these, but here's the list of the things we talked about today and some extras we did not discuss as well. Okay, I wanna show you a little bit about some of the lighting options and what they can do. As I was saying, these extra tools can make a really big difference in terms of separating you and the look of your photos from the other people that are doing similar work. So let's look at both of these. We'll go to the, the right-hand photo first, the, this um, portrait of the butcher with the hog. So this is lit with the FMV HDR 300. Again, that's a ring light. I was able to use it in the setting because the light was relatively low. This is an indoor place. There wasn't any of the lights on at all. I shut down all the lights. If you look at the, in his eyes, you can see the, the catch lights. That's the reflection from the light itself. So it's up and the left, and it's maybe only five feet away from his head. So it's just outside of the frame. So in this setting, I was able to use this instead of having the strobe with me. And if you want to do portraits like this, you're going to be indoors and be and be have controlled lighting. You can use um, that ring light, and it's a much cheaper option. It's going to be three hundred dollars as opposed to the pro photo, which should you get the full kit is going to run you up to two thousand dollars. But what the pro photo does, if we go look at the photo on the left, this is an outdoor shoot. We're in the middle of the day. Um, we've created all this smoke um, but, but behind using the car to burn some rubber on the road to create the kind of smoke around them. But we're in quite broad light. And the strobe, which creates a sudden high powered flash, way more powerful than your, your standard flash, your speed light that you would have from Canon or Nikon. This thing is much, much more powerful. And it gives us a sense we're sitting in a studio, even though we're at outdoors. And if you look really carefully, you compare a photo to this as opposed to an off-camera flash system that's shot with a speed light. What you'll find are these, these shadows. If you look at the shadows underneath their chins or the shadows around their bodies, they have a really, really soft, really, really beautiful fall off, almost like you would get um, if, you're, if you're outside on a, a very nice, very overcast day. So again, really, really gorgeous light, gives you that great studio look. And again, you can do this in a way that you can pack it all into your bag and fit it all in your bag. Okay, so two options there for lighting. I want to talk a little bit here about, about drones. Um, I've been working on a project for a number of years about sea level rise. And about year two or three into shooting the project, I, I got a drone and it was just an absolute moment of awakening for me because I realized I can tell this story in a much, much more powerful way if I can get up and show the magnitude of the issue. And in fact, the only way to do it is to get up and to show the magnitude of the issue. So this is in Washington state uh, on Quinault Indian Nation uh, land. And this is a fellow who's come out in the early morning to, um, to hunt uh, for, for razor clams. Um, and I get a photo here to the left of, of me shooting. This is also out in Washington state um, using the drone. And again, very, very easy to put in your backpack, uh, pack in and pack out with it. And it's a powerful way to be able to show the issues that you're working on. 
Okay, and then the outtakes. I'm going to show you two two shots here with the outtakes. Um, as as I mentioned in the in the last lecture, um, I've actually been a, a wedding photographer for um, coming up on on 20 years now. It's been part of what I do. As time has gone on, I've stepped more and more away from it. Um, but it's, it's, it's always been at the core of my work in some way or another. And this is a shoot I did just a few years ago in Ireland. Um, and if you look down into the, to the lower right, this is kind of the, the, the behind the scenes shot. Uh, I had a couple that were, got married on this lake and they really wanted to include the lake in the, in the shoot. And so with the Altex, I was able to put the camera inside of the Altex. You can see I'm carrying it there. Uh, I got down in, into, my, into my shortest of shorts and I walked out into this freezing lake. And then I was able to use the light it was, it was coming behind them to filter through the water to be able to create this effect, right? So really creative way to be able to use it to be able to create a shot you couldn't create any other way. And I'll show you one more here. Um, this is a portrait uh, that I shot for a recent project I was doing um, in Appalachia about Appalachian traditions and about fly fishing. And really the, I wanted to be able, I had to shoot maybe 60 or 70 photos to be able to get this right. But I really wanted to frame this character with the water. And again, the only way to do that was to get underwater, shoot half in, shoot half out. And the Altex allowed me to do that R really pretty smoothly and pretty simply. And you can see the Altex here. Um, I was telling you a little bit about um, you know, having it on a tripod mount and shooting with a boom. This is a setup I've used in British Columbia on a film I'm working on about killer whales. And this has allowed me to take a shot and be above water and then drop the camera slowly and evenly below water and get a shot that looks really, really incredible and really cool. Okay, uh, finally, I wanna spend a little bit of time here talking about um, some, some tips uh, for shooting in the field and then and we'll switch it over to your questions. So people ask me, you know, uh, what, what camera settings do you use? If I had to give you a summary, this is probably what I'm using most of the time when I'm out in the field shooting. For the shots that I do, I'm principally shooting at a focal length of between 20 and 50 millimeters. About 80% of the shots that I do are in that are in that range. So for me, I want to get go wide and get in really close to the subjects I'm working on. And that'll give your viewers a sense that they're in the space with these characters. For me, if I go longer than 50 millimeters, I'm sort of getting kind of a voyeuristic feel for a lot of the work that I do. You feel kind of too far away. And on the other hand, if you go below 20, you might get too much distortion, too, too wide of a field. So 20 to 50, again, is just about the right feel for me uh, for the work that I do, which is, again, why I absolutely love that 24 to 70 lens. Um, as I said, I shoot on aperture priority. I can explain some of that if that comes up. Why don't you shoot in, man, uh, in, in manual? Um, and I can explain that. But I typically shoot in aperture priority. And most of the shots that I shoot are between about f4 and f8 because I want to show some of the action that's happening in the foreground, in the midground, and in the background. Although for some shots, certainly if it's lower light, um, I might drop all the way down to 1.4, or if it's a portrait, or I might run all the way up to f22 if I really want to show everything that's going on. So I, I use the full range of apertures, but most of my shots for the kind of work that I do, they hover in the f4 to f8 region. Um, I use a shutter limiter on my camera, which means I set the camera so that the shutter can't go any slower than about 1 125th or 1 250th of a second. And the reason why I do that is really twofold. The first is over years and years and uh, years of shooting, um, I find that most of the shots that I can't use, the reason I can't use them is because of camera shake, right? And so by not letting the shutter go too slow, you're just reducing the possibility that's gonna happen. The second thing that's happened is that the ISO quality, the, the ability to have a high ISO and still have a great looking image has increased dramatically over the last six or seven years. So I'm not nearly as worried about the ISO going up. And finally, these cameras, which have stabilizers both in the camera body as well as in the lens, are just enabling the image to get sharper and sharper. And, it, and if that keeps happening, keeps moving in that direction, I might move the shutter limiter down to 1 60th of a second. But for me, most of the time, I want to keep it at 1 125th or 1 250th. Again, I principally shoot um, my ISO on auto, as I said, but I'll watch it very carefully. And if I'm in a situation where I really need to have manual control, full manual control, I will change over to that, of course. Uh, I'll change over to that um, with the ISO as well as um, the, the shutter. I'll put that on, on, on manual as well. And certainly if I'm using any of this portraiture equipment, the strobe, um, the off-camera flash, the lighting, I'm going to be fully controlling the photo to get it to look the way that I want. Uh, I shoot my white balance on auto because I'm shooting in raw, so there's no need to worry about that. I do put the camera on neutral picture setting, which is allows you the most leeway whenever you edit. Um, because I'm shooting um, documentary style work, and the, the, the critical thing here is to be able to get as many moments as possible. You're waiting for moments to happen. I do put the drive on high. I tend to shoot in, in three photo bursts. And I didn't say this before, but this is another 
critical thing about why you want a, a zoom lens for this kind of work. And it's because you can very quickly change between kinds of shots. You might have a moment that really requires a wide angle and you wanna be able to show that. And in the very next moment, you really wanna zoom in on somebody's reaction. Uh, so that's another reason that um, I should have mentioned before and forgot, but is a critical reason of why you want this mid-range zoom uh, and why also you wanna put her on a drive to shoot um, photo after photo. Uh, I do autofocus, of course. I switch back and forth between one shot and servo, depending on the situation. Do I have a moving subject? Is the subject still? And of course, I do use a filter and a hood to be able to protect the lens. Okay, last, let's spend a little bit of time here talking about some tips for shooting in the field. Um, so first, if you're going to be out in the field and you're going to make the most of your time there, I would strongly suggest getting in a day or two before you start shooting. Get yourself an Airbnb or set up somewhere and get a headquarters. Go out and buy groceries, get your charging and transferring station to charge your batteries, to transfer your cards. Get that all set up in advance. Get yourself comfortable and ready to do the work before you start working. I like to show up at least one day, sometimes two days in advance, just to get settled in before I start shooting uh, and get myself on that time and in that place. Of course, you're going to want to rise early and you're going to want to work late. The very best light when you're there is in the early morning and late at night. So get ready to be tired. I always say to, to my wife when I come back from shoots, she, she always thinks, oh, you've been on this great vacation. Haven't you had a great time? And the answer is yes, I absolutely love shooting in the field, but I lose more weight I'm carrying around all the gear and I'm more exhausted when I get home than ever because I'm only spending a few hours each night sleeping. I'm trying to make the most of the light uh, while I'm there. Of course, bring a lunch, bring water, bring protein bars. The last thing you want to have happen is you're on a shoot. It's really, really you know, working. And then you've got to pull back out to go back into town to get food at midday. I like to bring all the food with me that I need during the day so I can shoot all day long. Okay, I, I want to talk here a little bit about shooting with, with people and some thoughts about how to make your photos work when you're with people. So for me, I don't go into the shoot guns blazing, you know, firing 50 shots at once right away when I meet somebody. I want to put the camera to the side and I want to spend time working up to it with them. I might take a photo here and there, kind of get them comfortable with it. We have to remember just how uncomfortable it is to have a camera in front of us. When the cameras turn around on me, I'm always reminded of this. I've been shooting people for years and years and years. Uh, and yet when it comes back around, it's my turn to be in front of the camera. It is uncomfortable, right? So you want to spend some time just getting people comfortable with it, building up to it. Um, as much as possible, the ability to do this work is built on your relationships with people. We talked about this in the last lecture. So remember to be kind, crack a joke, be, be interested, be a really good listener, be interested in what they're into, be relatable, meaning talk to them about it, share your stories about it, and try to connect with them, right? It's your connection with your subjects that's going to enable you to do really, really great work. It's going to enable you to show them in an emotional space, which is going to enable the work to really shine and hopefully drive impact. Oftentimes, if I'm meeting up with a character that I'm shooting on an all day long shoot, I'm going to start with doing something that they're really comfortable doing. So I'm going to let them set the morning activity, say, what do you want to do? Show me. Show me what you're up to. Right. So we're going to do that. And as the day goes on, hopefully I can kind of step back and step back and step back and let them just be themselves through their day. And my work becomes more and more observational. I'm sort of moving from being in kind of a controlled space where they're controlling it to stepping back so I'm more of a fly on the wall. And I will space that out through the day to do that. And towards the end of the day, I might feel sort of empowered and comfortable to maybe even ask them to do something, right? To say, hey, can we go and do this? So I might direct just a little bit. The sword and the shield technique, um, this is the idea of bringing somebody else along with you. A lot of times for me, that's a writer. I love to work with writers when I can work with a writer. And the reason is, is because then you're not the one having to have the conversation all day long with the person, right? If you're the, the photographer, and you're there and you're building the relationship and maybe you're also doing the writer, it means you're doing too many things at once. And it's really hard to focus on your work. And it's also hard for you to step to the side and be able to take more candid photos. But if you have somebody there that can be maintaining that eye contact, keeping the conversation going, focusing on the details, focusing on the timing, you can really focus on your photography, right? So it's really great to work with a partner or to work with a writer if you can to be able to do that. Okay, remember to get everything you possibly can while you're there. I mean, shoot, shoot, and overshoot because the last thing you'll ever want is to go home and say, oh man, I just wish I had just asked to take that one shot or I wish I'd gotten up a little bit earlier. Push yourself while you're there and you'll get the most out of your work. And finally, people ask me, how many photos do I shoot? Well, I, I, I tend to want to shoot for about 100 uh, images an, an, an hour on, on average. Um, th there is such a thing as overdoing it, particularly when you're working, working with people. You don't want to have the shutter going absolutely constantly. Um, but 100 images an hour seems like a good rate for me. Okay, and then last one more slide here. Um, 
uh, on some of the finer points of being able to shoot uh, narrative style documentary images in the field and get the most out of the work. So the first thing is, it's not just about getting great images. Remember, it's also about story. And we talked about that last time. And so what you're looking here are moments, some, some sort of emotional moment that gets underneath the issue, shows us what the issue feels like to your characters, right? Shows them at their, at their most human, the tension they have, the vulnerability they have. And that's what you're looking for. That's what you're waiting for. If your photos feel process oriented, like we do this, then this, then that, and they feel quite stale, the impact is gonna be limited, right? So what you're really waiting for are the human, human moments. That's the high end, that's the high bar of photojournalism. Remember to be a photojournalist, and it's the journalist part that we're interested in here. So one of the best tools you have is your ability to ask questions. And your questions, you, you, you being there and the relationship that you have is going to drive the story forward. You're going to find out more about them, things you didn't know that lead you to knowing what to shoot next, right? The only way to be able to do this is to really spend time to get to know the story. So be a journalist as well. You're not just a photographer. You're there to know the story. And in knowing the story, you're going to create the best possible images. Right. You want to both be able to visualize your photos as they come in and anticipate them before they happen. So a lot of times I'll go into a space and I'll see what's happening and I'm going to be, be waiting and watching for reactions, but also trying to look and get myself into a space, a physical space in that room where I think I might be in, in a great spot to get the next photo. So I might go and sit in a space for 10 minutes waiting for my characters to come by and, and, and do what they're doing and allow myself just wait and wait and wait with the camera at the hip. And when I feel it's time that, and the action is finally gonna happen, I pull the camera up and shoot. But when you go into a space, you wanna imagine the shot you're gonna get out of it and hopefully get yourself in the position and then wait and wait and wait for it to happen. Um, also try shooting from the hip a little bit. And by that, I mean, not actually looking through the camera lens, maybe actually shoot a few at the hip. Maybe put the camera on the down uh, on the ground, put it up high. Remember to, to, to vary where you shoot from. And you don't always need to be looking. Sometimes these sort of casual candid shots can have some surprising results. So push yourself a little bit. Feel free to be a little bit creative with, with what you're doing. Remember if there is a moment, something happens, it's got some, some deep sort of emotional impact or content to it. Remember to hold that space rather than looking down and checking you know, your camera to see what happened. Just keep holding it there because the, the moment after can be just as powerful as the moment itself. And I know it's tempting to see if you got the image. I know it's tempting to put the camera down to give your character space, but just keep holding it, keep holding it, keep holding it because that's the sweet space you want to work in. Again, we talked about this before, ask them to show you, let them be the guide. Um, and we talked about is also don't just follow them around the room, feel free to hang back, give them space, allow them to be comfortable. And when they move through the space that you're in, that's when you shoot. And also, as a repeat, remember that great stories are fundamentally about feeling, right? So we want to get away from they did this, they did this, they did this. What you really want to tell your story with is, is with, with is what were the emotions that were present and how do we show those emotions with our images? Okay, so we talked about gear, what gear to have. This is how to deploy it to get the best out of it. And we've got just about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to stop our share here and give plenty of time for questions. Excellent. Yes. Question time. So if you do have questions that you want to get answered from Michael, uh, whether they be regarding this week, uh, what we talked about in terms of gear, or we just want to address something that maybe we didn't get to, or maybe you rewatched it and didn't have an opportunity to ask live last week, uh, go ahead, get them in. Uh, we'll get this started off with the first question. So we're talking about gear today and, and that's always, I mean, if, if, if you're, if you're a photographer, a videographer, I don't care what kind of ographer you're, you're into, you know, gear is always like, it's, it's a great conversation. And, and, you know, everybody refers to the, the traditional gas gear acquisition syndrome, you know, we've all got it, especially if you're in the field. So, you know, let's just get to it. Let's dive into it. We talked about a lot of gear today and obviously let's, let's eliminate the camera because that's too easy. And I don't want to, I don't want to give you a layup over here, but you know, when you're talking about gear and you're talking about going out into the field, what's to you, what's your most valuable piece of gear? Mm. So you uh, moving off camera and lens. Is that what you're saying? Or do you want? Yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna eliminate those two for you. I'm gonna eliminate those two because, because those are obviously. I mean, you know, we, we, we've got to talk about. You know, obviously, the camera, the lens is, is the most important part of the process in order to capture. But, but past that, you know, if, if there's something that you've got to take with you that you can't live without, what's that going to be? 
Yeah, well, it, I mean, it, what it really comes down to are these three things that I outlined to you before, which are these pieces of gear. And you can you can go for the high end piece. You know, you can get the Profoto B10 on the lighting end, or you can really start out low and get something right away that you can start playing with. But again, it's lighting. It's being able to control your lighting. Now, that's a slightly different look. It's not a pure documentary look, of course. You know, you're involved in creating the shot in some way. Um, but it is a really, a really powerful look. And you can use it in subtle ways as well, too. You don't have to have the overt, strong, polished look. But it's absolutely lighting. I, I rely on lighting to be able to make the shots I want to make. It's the aerial work, right? And finally, it's the underwater work. You put those three things together. And for the price of maybe a lens or two lenses, you can get involved in that space and really be able to make great images. So those are the things that I would highlight that are sort of secrets that not every know everyone knows about. And if you, um, if you get that stuff, you can rent some of that gear and play with it. You can really learn those things, maybe find out which one you wanna try first, you know, rather than, than do all three. But it's, it's those things that are the critical things they are always in my bag. Um, I will use them at, at least one of those three things, if not all three on almost every shoot that I do. Great, now let's talk, let's talk a little bit about lighting because I think that's another conversation that comes up a lot. People are always interested in, you know, for, for those people who are just getting started and venturing into lighting, where do you where do you kind of direct them to go? Are you are you more of a strobe guy or a continuous lighting guy? You know, where do you think is is kind of the best value bang for your buck? I know you've got a I know you mentioned you got a B10, which is you know a, a great light and and obviously it's an investment for for people. But uh, where do you recommend people go when when you're starting out and you're just looking? Maybe you're not ready to drop you know close to close to fifteen hundred dollars on a on a flash. Yeah, that's a really great question. So I, I did not jump right in to you know, having a strobe at first. Um, it's probably six years of playing with various lighters, lighting options before I decided, you know, I wanna make this investment. It's worth it to have a high-end piece of gear. There, there are cheaper strobes, I will say too. You can get a Godox, for example, that's quite a bit cheaper. So you don't have to jump into the high-end um, uh, uh, pro equipment. But before doing that, there's a series of steps you can take. And one of the first ones I would recommend to do is, is to get a ring light. Because what you can do is set your shot up just like you normally would, dial in just a little bit of light, you know, just turn this thing up a little bit and just see what it looks like. And you can easily move it around and play with it. Um, you can get these things for as cheap as if you want to get a really cheap one for under hundred bucks. I think this one's 200 or, or 300. So it's, it's a way to get started and not be totally overwhelmed. And this again, is a continuous light. It's not a flash. Um, they do make some ring lights that are also, um, that, that do work with, with the flash sync for off-camera flash. I think Roto Light perhaps does that. Um, but this is a really, really way to get involved. And the other one, and I don't, I don't have it here with me, um, is to take your speed light. And you may already have that for work that you do. If you shoot weddings or you shoot event um, uh, uh, events, you can take that speed light and get a really cheap off-camera flash system. There are knockoff ones that are 30 or $40. I bought a really cheap one first before getting a fancier one. And you can put that on your camera and just play with it and, and you know, see how you like it. Moving into off-camera flash and off-camera lighting, it does also mean having more control over your image, right? Because it's the way the metering works, the way it, the way you want the light to balance. It means you're going to move more and more towards taking a manual, a, a manually made image. You're really creating an image rather than taking an image. So it's definitely a step up. But you're absolutely right, Scott. It's a great question. You can come in slow and build up, and then decide, okay, do I really want to splash out, and am I really ready for the high-end piece of gear? Awesome. And, and for those people at home who are wondering how I get myself, you know, to be so amazingly evenly lit, it's, it's a ring light. I use a ring light too. Uh, full disclosure. I know, I know Derek's a lot fancier and he, he's, he's got a great look behind him. Uh, me, I've just got this wonderful white wall behind me. So uh, I just keep it basic ring light. It's, I, I agree with you. I think it's a great starter light and you can, you can capture a lot of great images with it and just play around with it and, and use it for, you know, a bunch of stuff get get crazy with it um now we do have a question coming here uh related to underwater photography um what is the most important non-photography related accessory for underwater photography maybe something that people don't think about every single day yeah well i'd, I'd say there's two things there the, the first is that i i would recommend absolutely on stepping up to get one of the um, higher end domes that that Altex offers. I mean, for, for me, if you've already bought, you know, a, you know, an L series lens, that's that's Canon's professional lenses, you've already put the high end piece of glass on the front in the form of investing in a you know a filter that's a hundred dollars. Um, it, it it just behooves you to go ahead and um, 
and, and buy one of these. Um, again, the photos that come through these look absolutely amazing. You can barely tell there's anything in front of it. So that would be the first thing um, that I would recommend doing is, is, is getting one of the domes and just investing in that. The second thing that I would think about doing is also lighting potentially for, for underwater lighting. Um, there are some underwater lights um, that you can get. And again, because Altex allows you to tether, which means you can run, you can run a line out, um, you can also have wired lights that, that come in and you can shoot them from above or you can shoot them from the side underwater. Um, but you can either think about um, lights that are constant lights you can bring underwater that are true underwater lights, or you can think about off-camera lights. And it's a, again, if you really wanna create separation uh, between yourself and the pack, that's an amazing tool to play with. And I've seen some, some, some great work out there. It's not something I've done, but it's something I, I want to do this year or the next. Now let's 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 dive further in, dive. See what I did there. Let's dive further into the Altex because this is something that intrigues me. I mean, I'm a big water guy at, at least when I can get into the water. Obviously, the winters over here get kind of cold, and so it's difficult too. But whenever I have an opportunity and I can get in, I get into you know the surf. That's 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 like my home. I love being out there. It's so great. And so you know things things like the Altex look like a great option. You know, from from my aspect, I'm I'm looking at it. And I'm thinking, you know, what are what are the limitations in terms of being able to be in the water? Is it, you know, something, is it a solution that's fully submergible? And if so, you know, is there, I know a lot of them on, on maybe kind of like, we're talking more of the plastic bags, which just obviously is not, but you have sort of that time limit and that time domain before you run into issues where it's like, well, your camera might get waterboarded, uh, you know? <laughs> Can you, can you speak a little bit about that and, and, and talk about those limitations if there are any? Yeah, well, I, for, for me, the limitations are more my personal limitations. So I'm not dive certified to, to any depth. Um, of, you know, I, can, I can go down a little bit, but I'm not trying to do anything that's going down into the Titanic. So I'm not worried about getting a piece of gear that's gonna be pressure certified at that level. But for me, what I'm doing, you know, going underwater 10, 15, 20 feet, the Altex is absolutely fine for that. So certainly it's fully submergible. A lot of the photos that I do, I'm only halfway submerging anyway. So it works perfectly for me. That said, there may be other situations, plenty of other situations where you need a big rig, um, you wanna go down deeper and perhaps you need a different tool. Um, you, you do have to remember, of course, to um, put a bit of Vaseline or, or, or lube on the Altex whenever you assemble it. You've gotta put it together the right way. It's on you to do that, to be able to keep it, um, to be able to keep everything inside dry. But I've tested it over and over again and I, and I personally never had any leaks. So I've, I've never been um, concerned about using it. Uh, but, but, but I think you're absolutely right. It's not a tool that's going to fit everyone in every circumstance, but for the kind of work that I'm doing, um, it works for me really well. And if I need to get another kind of image or, you know, I need to get a, a for video, then I'm going to pull in somebody who's a specialized underwater diver and they may, they may have their own tools they're using. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm definitely not diving down there. Not, not, on, not on the East coast, at least. <laughs> so, uh, talking a little bit about, uh, Images. You, you mentioned something inside of 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 your presentation towards the end. You you said that you shoot roughly about a hundred images per hour. Uh, what is in terms of your workflow? What does that look like? Obviously, if you're if you're shooting say three to four hours, that's that's just on a on a basis would be about three to four hundred images. How do you go through those images? How do you you know call through them? Is is there a process that you have in place that you've already kind of figured out how to just kind of cut them instantaneously so the, the process is sped up or do you really hammer down and just go through each one? Yeah, well, I'll answer for me. And again, for, for, my, for my needs, granting I principally work on long-term projects. Um, so I don't have a need to you know, get back to my news agency that day and turn them around. I, I work a little bit different in terms of my workflow. But let, let's just take an example and say, I've got two days in the field, 10 hours you know, each day. So I'm shooting 2000 images, right? So I come home. I have 2000 images. I, I run everything on an external hard drive. I didn't show that. I didn't show any of the at home gear today, just the gear in the bag, um, but I run everything on external hard drives. Um, I use G raid um, external hard drives. Everything is rated and everything's backed up in a, in a fireball, which I have um, down here beside me, but I put it on one of these raid drives. And again, a raid drive is a, is a hard drive that copies to one place and then the other place simultaneously. I put it on that, I bring it into Lightroom. And the very first thing I, I do is I go through a, a, a cool, uh, C-U-L-L on everything that is not usable. And typically that might be 800 photos. And for me, I just delete them off the drive. I take a lot of photos and so I don't have endless amount of money to save everything. So I go ahead and let those go. But everything that's not blurry or out of focus or totally unusable, I keep. So let's say I've got 1200 photos. And for me, then I'll go through, I will edit all of those. I do use a preset on, on all of those photos actually. Over time, I've um, generated a single look for my documentary work that I really like. And that's the starting point. 
So I'll preset all of them. And then I'll go through them each individually and then tweak that preset or I'll crop it a little bit, move it around. Uh, for, for me, because of the work that I do, I'm not making major changes. As much as possible, I wanna show what the scene like and be true um, to the story, be true to the space, be true to the people. So I'm not doing a lot of Photoshopping, um, but occasionally, you know, something needs to be brought out and something needs to be tweaked a little bit. But I'll go through and then finally, I'll move down to what is called a wide edit. If I'm gonna set to submit to a magazine, a wide edit might be 50 photos and some magazines might wanna see your full 50 wide edit. And then you might do a tight edit, 20, and then your final edit might be 10 photos. And you can star those or use a flag system or whatever. But depending on what you're asked for when you go to publication, you might need to have those different sizes that, that you need to share. So I'll kind of work through systematically. And I, I, I can say more about how you move down from wide to tight to final, what you want to have in your final collection that you publish, sort of that editorial focus. Um, but for sake of time here, we'll move on to another question or in, in, unless that's a, a, a focus you want me to take. Yeah, no, definitely. Now, Paul wants to know, and Paul's joining us from, on, on Vimeo. So thanks, Paul, for joining us here. Uh, two, two camera bodies. Thoughts on that? Are you a, are you a two-body shooter, single body? How do you, how do you travel? Yeah, great question. Um, so yes, I do have two camera bodies. Um, and I, it's, it, it is expensive to do. Um, I think once you're moving into a space where, you know, if you're working for, for somebody in particular, there's expectation you're going to deliver. It is the professional way to do it. For me, I'm not running with two camera bodies over my shoulder at any given point in time where I'm switching between one or the next. That's again, why I love the zoom is because I can very quickly on my lens switch between one scene and the next without having to change lenses, risk getting it dirty or risk losing the shot because I'm fiddling with lenses. So I only shoot with one body at a time. But that second body is a backup body in case something happens. I take a lot of risks with my camera. So I, you know, I've had very, I've been very lucky, but I, I don't, you know, think that will continue to be that way forever. I don't want to take that risk. So that's what the second body is for. But you may also want that second body to have it, for example, packed into your Altex already. You know, so you have one camera that's not used for other things, the other cameras in your Altex, or maybe you want to have it set up for a certain kind of shot. Maybe you want that set up for video or whatever. So there's ways you can use that two body system. Um, if, if you don't have two body, it's it's not a killer. Or maybe you have one body and then you have your backup body being something that's much more cheap and much more affordable. And that's okay too. You know, you don't feel like you need to sink ten thousand dollars in. Otherwise, you shouldn't be out in the field shooting. There are plenty of people I know that shoot with one body and make great work. It just means you're taking a bigger risk. Great. And and I've I've got duplicate questions here. Diana and Bobby both want to know. As far as you go, are, are both of your camera bodies the same or, or do you use two different models? For, for me, they're both the same. Yeah, I've got um, R5 for both. In, in the past, when I had a period when I had the 5D Mark IV, which by the way, shout out to 5D Mark IV users. Those are really, really great bodies. I had such a hard time letting go of that camera. I just absolutely love my Canon 5D Mark IV. Um, but I, when I had that for years. Um, and I had a Mark III as my backup. Uh, it, it's true that if you've got two different bodies, you know, there's two, the, the images on them are not the same, you know, so you can have a little bit of discrepancy in terms of the way the ISO is managed in, in particular, that's one of the things that might change or, um, you know, on the dynamic range of the image has changed a lot over the years. So you wanna be a little bit mindful of that, but if you're using it principally as a backup, you're still using your primary camera. So no, I wouldn't worry about that too much unless you're really trying to make sure that everything is totally seamless and your look is even across the board, then ideally you wanna have um, two of the same cameras. I certainly would recommend that you have two of the same camera makes, you know, you're not mixing bodies because it can be quite hard to edit your photos from a Nikon and a Canon and really get them to look seamless. That, that really can be tough. Definitely. Although, although if you're up for the challenge, I'd, I'd love to see somebody out there do it. That'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. I'm sure. Now, just to, just to kind of wrap it up and end it on a positive note, we've got a, we've got a little thing around here and I don't think we got this question to you last time. Uh, Derek wants to know, are you team lens cap or team <laughs> lens cap? Is there even a team no lens cap? Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> there, there is, there is, there's, there, there is a great deal of people out there who are team no lens cap. There are, I know, surprising. Derek, <laughs> Derek, Derek says he's the captain of team no lens cap. So, I, so there's, there's your answer. <laughs> I'll talk to Derek after this, after this video and see if I can help him out a little bit. Look, okay, so I, there's a lens cap on here. When I'm shooting, I'm going to take this lens cap off. And I'm going to put it in my pocket. So I'm going without a lens cap for most of the day, if that's what he means, right? So yeah, absolutely. But as soon as I put this camera down or I put it back in the bag, 
then the lens cap goes back on. So am I in between teams? I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure if I know. Part of the day, yes. Part of the day, no. But but I would not travel without a lens cap. You know, it's a really easy thing. You know, if your bag opens up, it slides out. You know, you want you want that plastic on there. Yeah, yeah. Derek, Derek's a lost cause. Derek's just completely lost all of them, and uh, we'll we'll have a we'll have an intervention with him eventually. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, thank thanks again for being here. Uh, want to want to let everybody know where where can they find you where can they follow you this way they can follow along with all the amazing work that you're putting out yeah great um you can follow me at michaelosnyder.com on instagram uh, you can check out my work at michaelosnyder um uh, dot com. Oh, i'm sorry at michaelosnyder for instagram www.michaelosnyder.com for the web um, and you can find me at gmail at michaelosnyder go figure and if you've got any questions or you want to connect um, i'm always available please do reach out Awesome. Well, I want to thank you again for being here. And I want to extend a huge thanks to the sponsors of this event, Outtext, for setting this up. Uh, if you didn't have an opportunity, if you joined us late, any of those things, please, as always, remember, you can always rewatch this along with all of the content that we're putting out there, everything on Vimeo, vimeo.com slash BH Event Space. You could also visit Facebook, BH Event Space. We put all of our videos on there as well. Uh, Follow us on Instagram, BH Event Space, pretty much BH Event Space everywhere. Um, so that's that's all we've got for now. Michael, thanks again for being here. Everybody at home, thanks for joining us. This has been another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. Thanks.